Hello everyone, um, I'm gonna make a film about swapping a gearbox uh, on an Opel Corsa. This is a 2014 Opel Corsa 1.4 petrol with 100 horsepower. And what we're gonna be doing throughout this film is we're gonna swap the box on it with another one that you can see here with a different code. Now, if you look down here, this is where the codes of the gearboxes are. And uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because the Corsa of that generation came with multiple types of gearboxes, manuals at least, in the sense that there are at least two main versions. And by the way, the, the box is on the left-hand side behind the front left wheel and the so like I was saying there are two boxes one of them has five short ratios and the other one has five longer ratios the box on the car is with short ratios and the one that I'm going to be putting on this one has longer ratios um, the reason I'm doing this is because this car is going to be used mainly on highways like uh, cruise control high speed driving 100 kilometers an hour like 60 miles an hour or more constant driving and for this kind of driving um short ratio gearbox the short ratio gearbox is not necessarily ideal because what's going to happen is in the fifth gear it's going to keep the rpms rather high and the fuel consumption a bit high whereas this one which has uh, third, fourth, and fifth gears a bit longer, is obviously gonna have um, lower RPMs when driving on the highway. So first things first, let's take a look at how you can figure out what kind of gearbox this is. Now every gearbox from, at least these ones from Opel, Vauxhall, etc., have a, a serial number which is stamped on the box itself now, if you look at its location, it's effectively to the left side of the box. If you look at it from here, from this angle, this is where the front left wheel goes. So if you want to see what code your box has, just turn the wheel a bit to the left and read it. Um, it, it is possible that on some boxes the code may be more difficult to read. But in this case, at least on this one, it's fairly clear. So this box has the code A12280921 AT6W419. Now, how do you read this? A indicates where it was made. A is for Aspen, I think, and B is for Bochum, like one of the two cities where they have factories for making a gearbox. The one and two, the 12 immediately afterwards, uh, I don't know if it's visible, I'll put it like this. The 12 indicate the year of manufacture. So this box was made in uh, 2012. The next digits, which is uh, which are 280921, uh, these are just a serial number, uh, no specific meaning. What is interesting afterwards is 86W419. Now 86 indicates uh, a five-speed gearbox of the F17 model with the longer ratios. Now the F17 box is common on many Opel and Vauxhall applications and it's uh, it's been around since I think 2000 or maybe even earlier. It's gone through some changes uh, throughout its life. For example, uh, in the later years, they've actually added a synchronizer to the reverse gear, which means that on older models, for example, you sometimes have, have to work a bit to put the car in reverse, whereas with these ones, it's it's very straightforward. There's no grinding. There's no problem to put in the reverse. Um, right. So 86. Getting back to the code, 86 is the model is the F17 box with the wider ratios, specifically for Corsa D, the same car we're going to be working on now. The W afterwards also indicates that this is a wide gear box, and then the last digits 419 indicate the differential ratio or the final drive as it's called. 419 means it's a final drive of 4.1921, okay? 
And why is this important? Because we're gonna see later that the box we're gonna take down from the car uh, is also an A something. It's actually an A14 because the car is from 2014. Um, the the serial number I I can't read it from the from the odd box. It's a bit uh, it's not very visible. But the code of the box on the car is 87C419. 87 together with C indicate that that is the close ratio gearbox, but it has the same final drive of 4.19 to 1. Okay, and throughout this film, I'm going to take it step by step with everything that I'm doing. Um, this is, well, my first ever gearbox swap, which makes me a bit nervous. But uh, this is also the reason why I've gone... Uh, to the trouble of getting a service manual, the Haynes manual, which is very good for, for, for the course at least, and all the necessary tools, gaskets, oils, and everything I'm gonna need uh, to make sure that I do the job right. Um, I'm gonna welcome all kind of uh, constructive feedback from you guys. So if there's anyone out there with uh, more experience than me, uh, which I'm sure there are a lot of people, um, okay, I'll feel free to point out if I make or if I've made any mistake. Uh, last thing, I'm doing this purely um, maybe to help out if there's anyone else curious about how this kind of operation is being done. Uh, but you know the visual drills, uh, I don't take any liability if someone else um, you know, does this job, gets it wrong, etc. Et so uh, this is just, just see this film purely as like the way I chose to do it, uh, I chose to do this operation. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do obviously, is we're going to have to remove the two front wheels, jack the car up, make sure it is jacked up properly so that it is extremely safe to work underneath. Um, I'm going to do that and uh, show you the outcome. Okay, so first step is to raise the car up and remove the front wheels and uh, so we can have room to work underneath. Now, before you start doing any of this, make sure that the handbrake is raised, obviously, because we need to have the car secure so it doesn't roll back when you raise it up from the front. Now, before raising it from the ground, make sure to slacken off the nuts which hold the wheels. Um, for this, I use a normal breaker bar, okay, with an extension. In this case, I think the nuts on the wheel are 17 millimeter. I don't know if you can see on the, uh, on the, uh, I don't know what the name of this thing is in English, but uh, you know. So this is a 17 millimeter unit and you put them and you normally just slack them off a bit. These are, I've already slackened these off a bit, but I'm showing you how it should be done. You slacken them off a bit, but you don't remove them. Then you proceed to raise the car and only afterwards when the car is raised up and you have a couple of centimeters between the wheel and the ground, do you actually remove the wheel. Now, on Opel Corsas, in the user's manual, it shows you that there are four points near one near each wheel where you're supposed to raise the car up. You can see each of the points has these, this little bump over there that little bump in the front that's where the hand jack goes but we're not going to be using a hand jack we're going to be using a, a hydraulic jack because you know, it makes life easier all right so the nuts are slackened the jack's in position and i'm gonna keep raising it by hand bit by bit until the wheels off the ground One important thing to note, um, so I was saying earlier that this is the jack jacking point. Uh, it's true, but it appears that this one works best only with the car jack. Uh, if you have the hydraulic jack, for example, that has this kind of head, you can use it here, but there is a chance that this, did, this bit might bend a bit. Okay, so what I did in this case, I jacked up on this steel beam which is like 
a few centimeters back and this one holds up pretty well and a third point where you can raise the car up if you want is the front subframe here which is made of steel okay so it doesn't bend and as you can see i've already put up one of the uh supports okay holding it on the front subframe and it's holding it pretty well and as you can see the front wheel is already a bit raised off the ground so i'm going to proceed with removing the wheel uh raising uh, the other bit and putting all the other uh jacks up to make sure the car is is, uh, is properly secured okay so we've raised the car up and as i said we've secured it uh very very well so as you can see i've put the four jack stands the two in front are on the front subframe on steel the second ones the the last two ones the ones a bit in the back should normally support this bit of steel here which i've also used when i raised the car with a hydraulic jack now because these are can't be raised uh or can only be raised in steps in the current step they don't actually uh connect with the car okay so there's like a two millimeter gap but that's fine okay because they are secure and in the extremely unlikely event that the front one should by some uh scenario collapse these two which are like a few millimeters below the car are just gonna take the weight and also i've also put the two front wheels here and i'll put some wood planks on top of them and they can support this beam in case these ones also fail so it's in this setup it's highly unlikely that the car would collapse uh as it's standing right now so i guess this is an example of how you should secure your car when you work underneath so like you make absolutely sure there is zero chance of the car coming down so like i said never ever uh support if you work underneath the car never ever support it only on a uh, on the jack which you use to raise the car that's good for example only if you want to change a wheel or remove a wheel put one back etc but never ever support the car only on one jack when you work underneath it okay the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have to remove the underbody shield here now this thing is not usually part of an opal corsa the corsas i've seen actually don't have an underbody shield um, but actually installed one this is steel i actually installed one because uh well in uh we can run into some i don't know uh, stuff on the road or like potholes etc and i wanna i wanted to make absolutely sure that there's zero risk of a pothole or something hitting the uh, engine bay okay so that's a bit of steel which is uh secured to certain mounting points on the car uh, you can you can buy them they're pretty cheap i guess this one was about i don't know if, uh, about 50 euros or something uh you can buy them off uh ebay or internet and it's a 15 minute job to install them so but i think they're useful to prevent the engine of the car from you know getting hit by who knows what okay so we're gonna remove that and we're gonna uh, then we're gonna take the manual and start doing it step by step to remove the gearbox one other thing which i want to show you guys um i mentioned earlier about the gearbox serial number and how where it's located and how you can read it um in this case this is the serial number on the box that's on the car and as you can see it's pretty pretty difficult to read right so on the earlier one the one we want to put on it was easy on this one it's far more difficult but i'll try to read at least the last digits so the first one is a so same factory as the other one the next digits are one four so as we would expect this box was made in 2014 then the last ones are 87 c419 uh maybe change the light a bit in case that helps but you can 
maybe read 87C419. So 87 is the short ratio, 5-speed F17 gearbox. C also for short uh, or close ratio, sorry. And 419 is the same final drive as the one we want to put on. Um, just a quick mention, I keep saying F17. The, uh, the Opel gearboxes, or at least the petrol ones, uh, there are multiple variations, F13, F15, F17, and so on. Now the number after the F indicates, you multiply that by 10, and that gives you the maximum torque that the gearbox can withstand. So F17 is a gearbox that can take up to 170 newton meters. The torque is given in newton meters, uh, not foot pounds. So uh, be careful with that if you guys want to make any improvements on the engine or whatnot. You need to also check the rating of your gearbox and make sure you don't exceed the torque limit of the box. So in case of F17, it's a uh, 170 newton meters box. That's the max torque it can take. Okay. The next step for us is to disconnect the battery and take it outside because we need to then remove the base on which the battery stands so that we can access the uh, support which actually holds the gearbox to the chassis of the car. So to remove the battery you will need a 10 millimeter socket to first remove the negative terminal, just unscrew it or any other 10 millimeter uh, bit that you have. Okay. Don't need, you don't need to remove it completely, you just need to make sure that it's disconnected to the point where you can actually remove the connector by hand. Okay, see, it came off. Now, put the connector somewhere uh, in such a way that it doesn't make contact with the battery anymore. Like this is a good place, at least temporarily. So now the battery is disconnected, but in order to uh, remove the positive terminal, we need to take a look a bit on this plastic cap and for us to see what this does, we need to remove the cover. And there are three plastic points which you can actually lift with your finger uh, so you can take a look underneath the cap. So there's one here, there's one to the front at this point, and then there's one to the left, okay? And if you remove each one of them gently, no need to pull too hard, it will then allow us to move this like this. And if we now see here, we see that we can uh, either with the same 10 millimeter remove this connector altogether, but then the plastic bit will still be tied to the connector and we may not have as much room as we need to work. The better solution as given in the manual is to first remove this metal bit. This needs a 13 millimeter or a half inch hexagonal bit to remove. And you can remove this first. Uh, and this should, in principle, allow us to remove the plastic head first. And then we can remove the big connector. So we take our ratchet. Obviously, there's no electrical risk now because the battery is disconnected. And we just pull. And it... Uh, We disconnect it quite easily. Once we remove the bolts, make sure you don't lose the bolts because we'll need them later. So put it somewhere safe, like here. And now to actually remove the plastic bit, this plastic bit, there are three plastic legs that you can see here, the big ones, one here and two over there, which you can also remove by hand or at least should be able to remove by hand. This is one of them. The second. And uh, 
Should also be the third, though I'm having some issues. If it doesn't work by hand, uh, you can actually use the tip of a screwdriver to just put it underneath there and uh, just pull gently. So pull gently, make sure that you don't rip the plastic. Okay, once that comes off, you can remove this all together and put it to one side. Okay, put it somewhere. It doesn't really matter where, but for now just put it here. And now we can disconnect the positive terminal and take the battery out. Okay, we can use the same 10 millimeter socket, a uh, wrench, sorry. Uh, let me switch hands. Okay, so with the 10, and we just twist. There are obviously better tools for this, uh, but this is what I have available right now. Okay, and up to the point where you can actually spin this by hand. Okay, you can spin it by hand. And once we've done this, um, we can now remove this connector, just wiggle it a bit. And it should gently, it should eventually come out. See, it's coming out. Uh, okay. Now, before you remove it all together, a good idea would be this bolt that we took out for the metal bit here. You can screw it here back, just so you make sure you don't lose it. Okay, and now we continue to pull on the cable until eventually it comes out. Okay, so now once it came out, it's properly disconnected. The next step will be to just physically remove the battery. The last thing that we need to do to physically remove the battery, um, if you take a look down there, there's a metal clamp with a screw that you see can be seen down here. This is actually the clamp which holds physically holds the battery in place. So the last thing we need to do uh, before removing the battery is to unscrew that bolt and then we can take the battery out. To be able to access that bolt down there, you're gonna need some kind of extension to your ratchet. Uh, but it comes out pretty easily. I use the same half inch bit or 13 millimeter. And you just, just until it eventually comes out. It's a pretty long bolt, I think. Yeah. And this is how it looks like once we've removed it. So it's a clamp with a screw with a bolt that just comes out all together. It just comes out. You can put it somewhere. And now the battery should. There we go. See, you can move it. Uh, we should just be able to pull it out and take it out of the car. Uh, for some reason, the handle for this one is missing. Okay, I took the battery out. I needed both hands for that, so I uh, stopped the film for a few seconds. Um, here's the battery. It's outside. Uh, I'll actually charge it uh, a bit to make sure it's full when I put it back up. Um, and the next steps for us will be to remove three bolts which actually hold this base in place. There's one here, you can see it. There's another one here and the third one is over there. And once we remove these, these three, the base should just come out okay. uh, so after a bit of checking these are also 13 millimeter bolts uh, i actually found the 13 millimeter bit a uh, bit to remove everything also works on these so all of these are 13 
Um, just one thing to mention. Uh, that one's a bit more trickier to access. Uh, if you want to access it from the top, if you have a lower ratchet, you can access it easily. Uh, this one's easy to access. The only thing to mention is here on the third one, you see this, this little plastic cap. Now this cap uh, is in place to hold the battery depending on the battery size. So you can just wiggle it out. It's a small plastic bit, see it looks like this. And you either place it here at the front, if you have a 14 amp hour battery, it's actually the number is stamped in the plastic, it says 40, 40 amp hours here. And if you have a larger battery of 50 amp hours, it stays in the front position. Our battery is a 50 amp hour, so that explains why this cap was here. In any case, you can just wiggle this one out, you take it out, and then you can access the third bolt. I'm using the, the, the ratchet with the same extension I used earlier, because it was already here. And these, all three of these just unscrew with very little force. Um, there's one more thing that I want to show you guys. So in the particular case of this car, and it's, I'm guessing it's related to the 1.4 liter engines because other cars, other Corsa Ds don't have this. The, the ECU, so the car's computer is actually placed here. You see this one on the side of the battery tray here. From what I know, other Corsa these actually have it somewhere around here, hidden behind this plastic. And for all the other Corsas, uh, the Haynes manual actually says that removal of the tray is quite simple. So as I showed you earlier, there are the three bolts, one there, one there and another one at the back that you need to remove. And then you just slide the tray, you pull it away. It's a very, very simple job. For this car, however, things are I'm slightly more complicated because after you remove the bolts, you're faced with the problem. The tray, okay, so the bottom plastic has the support of the ECU hooked to its side as well as several electrical cables which are tied to the tray via plastic clips. Which means that after you remove those three bolts, it is impossible to remove the tray and you have to make certain modifications which I haven't seen in the manual so I had to figure them out on my own. It's been also pretty tricky because I tried to salvage the clips. Uh, now these clips if you take a look at them normally they're fairly easy to remove you see because they have those plastic jubilee links which you can cut and then you remove the cable and then you remove the clip but if you do that you then need to have new clips to install when you put everything back again. I didn't have new clips, so I did my best to actually remove them from beneath the plastic to make sure they're still intact, so I can just clamp them back at the end. And that got pretty tricky. Um, you just have to, you know, try by hand. You go, you put your hand underneath these, this point and you feel the clip and you need to clamp it with your fingers and pull it up. It, it, it was quite tricky. So anyways, what you need to do is, first of all, there's this small wire that you see here, the black one. This is a, a grounding wire which connects to the chassis of the car. So you can see it down there. So the first thing you need to do is you need to disconnect that. That's simple to do. I think you need a 11 millimeter bit. You unscrew that, uh, uh, that head, you pull the cable out, you screw the head back. That's simple. You need to do this because otherwise you don't physically have room to pull the ECU up. After you've done that, there are three plastic points that you need to disconnect from the tray. One is around this area, you can feel it by hand. The second is here, the one from here. The third one is there, it's very easy to remove. And there might be a fourth one here at the back, I don't fully remember, but anyways, this was easy to do. Once you've done this, the only thing that still holds everything together are the thick cables, which are still connected with clips. So you have to remove, there are four clips that you need to remove by hand if you want to keep them. Like I said, if you want to throw them away, it's much easier. You just cut the plastic jubilees here. Uh, 
take the cables to the side and that's it. But I salvage the clips because I'll need them later. So the first one is here. You see this one, which actually goes into that little hole down there. This one was fairly easy to remove because you have access, very easy access to the bottom of the clip. So you just, with your two fingers, you just squeeze it from here and you push it. And this one comes out, okay? The biggest problem are these two that you can see one here you can see it there and there's another one over there and there's also a third one which i think is a bit difficult to see in the in the film but it's right there when i'm pointing my light these are the last three clips for which you will have to do most of the work to remove and you basically have to put your hand from behind here and you should, like I said, you have to feel for them and you have to pinch them out. It, it might take a number of tries, but after you, you pinch all of, all of them, all the three out, you can slide the ECU cover gently off. You raise it up, okay? And you, you put it to the side, okay? And then when all of that is done, you can pick the battery tray, uh, making sure that you have room. And then you can pick the bat, like I said, you pick the battery tray and with a little effort, you can actually raise it up. And uh, it's a bit difficult because I'm also hold holding the phone, but then you can raise it up and you pull it out of the car. Okay, so just be mindful of that in this particular kind of engine. It's slightly more difficult to do uh, with all of the clips and all the connections. It's not impossible, but I haven't seen this written in the manual, so uh, you have to figure out, just work gently, take your time. Otherwise, because these are all plastics and they might be old, they, they might snap if you pull on them too hard. So just be careful. For m many other versions of, of the Corsa D, like I said, the, 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 the ECU is somewhere else and you don't have this problem when you pull out the tray. Okay, so now with the tray out, the reason why we needed to take out the battery tray is because we now have access to that area down there, which is the, that's the bushing, you see to the right, which actually connects the engine and gearbox assembly to the chassis on this side. There's another one like it to the left. It's actually beneath the air filter. Um, I'm pretty sure we won't need to touch that one because what we will be doing, we only need to disconnect this one because we'll be lowering, later on, we'll be lowering the gearbox and engine assembly under a jack by a couple of centimeters so that we're able to pull the gearbox out on that side. Okay, and I'll show you guys, moving on from here, I'll show you guys uh, the steps that need to be done. Oh, and I also took the opportunity to keep things cleaner. I took the opportunity to connect that metal strap temporarily to the positive connection of the battery, just to make sure that there are not that many pieces moving around, uh, moving around in the engine. Moving on, according to the manual, the next thing we need to do is um, we need to secure the hydraulic line, which actually controls the uh, slave, sl uh, slave cylinder on the clutch. Now the, that hydraulic line, uh, starts from the brake fluid reservoir because the uh, clutch actuation actually uses the same uh, brake fluid as well the brakes um, and there's a pipe that goes through here down through here you can see you can see down here it's covered it's a metal pipe that also covered in a bit of rubber it goes it goes tights here and here it links to a flexible hose that you can hopefully see here and this flexible hose goes on and connects to this plastic bit, if you see my finger here, to this plastic bit in the, in the gearbox, in the outside of the gearbox. And inside is the slave cylinder that engages and disengages the uh, pressure plate on the clutch, okay? So the first step to do this is we need to go to the brake fluid reservoir and, well, First and foremost, clean it to make sure we're gonna open it. Clean it to make sure there's no dust or debris going inside the brake fluid. You need to open it up. It opens up quite easily. And you need to place a bit of plastic foil 
like a simple plastic foil on top, like this. And then you close it back. And the reason why you're doing this is once you're gonna disconnect the... Uh, so once you disconnect the clutch uh, pipe, normally brake fluid is, is gonna start to come out. And if you don't prevent air from getting inside the brake fluid reservoir, then all of the brake fluid is gonna come out because the brake reservoir is higher than the point where the, uh, where the pipe goes into the gearbox. And the danger with this is if it gets too low, you're gonna put air, we're gonna put too much air here and then you might have to actually bleed the entire brake system. You don't wanna do this which is why we put this plastic here and we put the cap back on so we make sure no air uh, goes inside the brake fluid reservoir. Our brake fluid reservoir is actually pretty full and now we've secured it from losing too much fluid once we disconnect that pipe. And I'm showing you how the clutch, uh, the clutch uh, fluid cable is, dis is disconnected from the gearbox on the assembly which is already removed. Now this actually comes from the gearbox that I will be installing. Um, obviously I won't use this bit because this one is cut, but uh, for demo purposes, this is very good because uh, inside the car, the space is limited and it might be a bit difficult for me to film while I'm doing it. So how this is held together is using this metal clip that you can see here. And what you need to do, you need to take a small screwdriver or a, a nail or something you stick it here behind this metal clip and you gently pull it out it doesn't take too much force and you need to pull it out to this out outermost position at which point the cable comes out using a single hand quite easily okay you just remove it like this now do take note there's a small rubber o-ring here um, at the end of the metal tip of the cable. The manual recommends that you change this when you work on the cable. Um, I don't actually, I haven't ordered a spare one, so I'll be using the this existing one, but I will keep a lookout after I install the gearbox and if there's any fluid leaking, I'll know it's coming from this little O-ring and it'll have to be replaced. But so far, the existing one on the car is behaving well, so maybe I won't need to replace it. Okay. So do keep, keep in mind, uh, in the same way that we covered the uh, brake fluid reservoir with plastic, once you disconnect the two pieces, do the same. So take a bit of plastic and cover both this as well as this, and maybe some duct tape to keep it in position. So you make sure that no dust or dirt or anything else actually goes into either the pipe or the plastic hub when you're working on the car and the manually ex the manual expressly states while these bits are disconnected do not depress the clutch pedal okay because you don't want to cause pressure in the system uh, the fluid pressure in the system and another important or i would say very important mention is Obviously, like I said, the moment you disconnect these two, some brake fluid will inevitably come out, even after you put the uh, plastic foil on the brake fluid reservoir. Now, it's highly recommended that you maybe use a cloth or something underneath, underneath the point where these two get connected, so that it catches the fluid, the brake fluid. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is brake fluid is, um, uh, affects paint. Okay, so all brake fluid, if it falls on any surface that is painted, it takes about 30 seconds to a minute to cause irreparable damage. And it's also, it may be uh, dangerous to some other, I don't know, maybe plastic components or, or rubber components in the, at the base of the car. So just to be safe, uh, put, a plas uh, put a, a bit of, I don't know, some material to catch any brake fluid that drips from the from this connection. And here it is how it looks like uh, from underneath the car. It's actually easier to work on this from underneath the car. Here it is. Now, as you can see, like I said, I've disconnected the two just like I showed you and put some plastic foil on both ends, both here as well as on the plastic hub here and tie them up 
Obviously, this is just temporary, but it prevents uh, some fluid from coming out. I've only lost a little bit of fluid because we put the plastic foil on the uh, brake fluid reservoir. But most importantly, it prevents anything from getting inside, both in here as well as in, uh, as well as in here. <sighs> right. The next step is quite simple. And we have to disconnect the reverse switch, which is here. It's the only electrical connection to the box. You see it right here. This also doubles as a uh, brake, uh, sorry, as a gearbox uh, fluid filling point. We'll do that at the end when we change the boxes. Uh, to do this, uh, there is a small plastic tab which you need to raise up with your finger and then you gently pull and it, it comes out quite easily. Okay, you can tuck this one uh, somewhere here, maybe to prevent or like this, so that it doesn't uh, interfere with anything. Okay, um, at this point, there are no more non-mechanical connections to the box. So all the remaining steps that we have to take and which we'll have to be very careful with, we'll have to start removing bolts one at a time until the point that the box can come out. And as a little side note, just to show you how a reverse switch works and looks like. So it's, it's something like this. And what it does, you see it has two metal connections and the way it works is, this is basically outputting uh, infinite impedance that is it disconnects the circuit when the switch is off meaning when you're not in reverse so in all the forward gears when you are in reverse a mechanical component uh, in the gearbox actually pushes on this tip like so and the moment this tip is pushed this uh, the two pins become connected internally so the impedance drops from infinite to zero and you have a closed circuit Right, so this is just sort of like a sensor which tells the ECU that the box is in reverse, and this is needed so that all the uh, rear lights, reverse lights, parking sensors get activated the moment you put your car in reverse. So, if for example, it happens at some point that none of your reverse lights work, or your parking sensors don't work, or something and you've run many other tests and uh, you can't find the fault, maybe it's because of this part. I've actually had to change this on a Ford uh, Fusion a couple of months ago, and after doing some debugging on the car, I figured out it was because this was broken. So I just replaced this and, uh, and everything worked as before. And we begin by removing the uh, connection to the lower control arms on each side, on each front wheel. Which means we have to disconnect this assembly and pull the control rods down. Why we're doing this is because the next step after we do this, we gain access in order to remove the front drive shafts, shafts from the gearbox. Um, and this set of steps is actually much easier than what the manual recommends. Now the manual recommends that you take out the entire uh, drivetrain, so the entire assembly holding the wheels, connecting them to the gearbox. Um, now the reason, the main reason why I'm not going down that route is because that's very complicated. Uh, it's very difficult to do for a DIY and also um, you may need some special tools to align it once you have to reinstall it. Instead, these steps, and I've seen them being done by, by uh, other more experienced mechanics, are much simpler and take much less time to do. So, like I said, we'll be disconnecting this first. Um, I'm going to show you on this wheel, obviously on the other wheel the steps are identical. And the first thing when you want to work on uh, bolts that haven't been touched in a long time, uh, it's a very good idea to apply some penetrating oil. See, like, let that soak in penetrating oil a bit. And that should ease up for a couple of minutes. And that should ease the removal of, uh, of the bolt. Now both this, as well as the other sign, are 16 millimeters. And uh, 
Obviously, the idea is to hold one in place using a 16 millimeter key while you untwist the other one. All right, and after some attempts, I've managed to loosen the nut, the one that you see here. Uh, it's pretty loosened, though I can't yet untwist it by hand. Um, and that, and because of this, the next thing to do is you need to gently hit this with a with a metal mallet or something to make sure the screw actually moves uh, on the other side, and then you can actually remove both itself and the nut. Tried hitting the nut with a mallet or with a small hammer and it doesn't move on the other side um, don't necessarily hit harder so that you might bend something don't do that instead what you can do is you can try and spin the bolt on the other side again 16 millimeters and the reason why it may be stuck is because if it may have formed rust and if it forms rust what you need to do is you first need to uh, break that rust seal from the bolt okay and you just need to do this one way is to use an impact gun or alternately if you don't have an impact gun you can just twist on the other side um until it can well spin freely okay and once you get it to spin freely if you now take the mallet and you hit again gently it will start to move okay as you can see it has moved a bit in the back and now it's fairly straightforward to actually to physically remove it show you after removing the bolt this is how it looks like okay so on the exterior part it was mostly rusted as you can see it but some of the rust actually got also got inside and this was the rust that was initially preventing us from uh, from moving it side to side but once we've sp uh, we've spun it a bit that rust seal was broken and then it was much easier to remove it after we've removed the bolt the next step is we need to separate the two metal bits that actually hold in the lower control arm so that we can then pull it down. And the way to do this is there's a small, a small gap between the two here that I'm showing you and which you basically need to enlarge gently, uh, for example, with something like a chisel. Okay, so I have this small chisel, I'll knock with a hammer at the end and just separate them but not by much maybe a millimeter or something but the the, the purpose of the separation again is uh, to reduce the pressure on this bolt which connects the lower arm and also to break any rust seals and this is how it looks like after the two pieces have been disconnected so as i said you need to drive a chisel between those two metal parts to split them apart and then you can, you need to apply some force to the lower control arm, either directly with a hammer or you can create a leverage with a bar uh, metal pole, for example, that goes through here, get supported, for example, where the jack stand is, and then you go to the front of the car and push on that, uh, on that metal pole, however you prefer. Just take note that if uh, you apply force on the control arm and it doesn't go down, then you might actually need to separate these two even more, okay? So there is a point at which you've separated them. See, like the split now is about two to three millimeters wide. And I was able by uh, hitting this with a hammer, by hitting the control arm with a hammer to actually pull it down, okay? And this is how it looks like when the two are separated, okay? You might, if you want, you can also apply some uh, uh, some of that penetrating oil beforehand to make your life easier. And also, if you want more access, you can turn the steering wheel so that uh, the the two metal bits uh, may are not directly above the control arm or maybe uh, and they're made to the left or to the right this makes it easier to to split them apart to have access with the chisel to split them apart proceeding to the to the removal of the drive shafts we need to remove this metal bar that you see here 
which is tied down with two bolts, one here and obviously one on the other side. From what I can tell, these are 16 millimeter bolts and they just come out with minimal effort. And proceeding to the drive shafts, uh, notice that where the drive shaft enters the gearbox, there are a couple of dents, see, like the ones here. And what you need to do is you need to use a pry bar or a chisel and uh, effectively push them out towards the outside of the box. Okay, we can do this because as we've seen earlier, we've disconnected the lower control arm. So there is room for the drive shaft to come out. It might take a little bit of effort, um, but it's not terribly complicated. Uh, do notice, for example, that if you want to use a chisel or something else, apply the force with the hammer, not upwards. So don't hit like this, because you might damage something on the with the bearings outside of the gearbox. Instead, try to hit from a side so that the, the tip of the chisel will attempt to move the prop shaft towards the outside, okay? Obviously, it, it's uh, similar to on the other side. Uh, two more things uh, that are really worth mentioning. Um, number one, the right-hand side drive shaft is much easier to remove the one that I'm looking at right now, because you can easily stick a lever right here between the end of the drive shaft and the gearbox. So this one doesn't really take that much effort. The left one is a bit, it's a bit trickier because like I showed you, the only points where you can push are here and these aren't very deep. So it's difficult to get grip here in order to create leverage, but they both come out eventually. And what I want to mention is number one, the moment you remove them from the from the differential from here at the bottom of the gearbox there might be some gearbox fluid dripping out depending on how how much oil the gearbox has so be mindful of that and maybe put a cloth beneath or something to catch it number two after you remove the pro the drive shafts make sure to seal both ends of the differential the left and the right with some plastic or whatever other means that prevents oil from dropping out, but most importantly prevents dust and debris from getting in. It's the same thing like we did with the uh, with the clutch fluid pipe, same principle. And the last thing, um, the manual says uh, to not let the drive shafts uh, rest on their own weight. So the moment you take them out, don't just leave them dangling. Instead, use I don't know some some mean that you or some. Uh, way whatever you prefer to hang them to, to a bit of metal or something so they don't rest on their own weight because if they do you might damage the the cv joints at the end just to give you guys an example here is how it looks like after you we've removed the prop the drive shafts okay this is on the left side and i've hooked it up to the coil on top but you can hook it up however you want and on the right side, I didn't actually need to hook it up anywhere because it's actually resting on the on the exhaust. So the right side drive shaft doesn't or may not necessarily need to be hooked up to anything because it has where to it has a place to sit on. Moving on, we're going to disconnect the gear linkage support from the gearbox, the gear linkage obviously being the a uh, system which links your gear lever to to the box itself and one way to to do this is to remove this metal clip that you see here okay this metal clip needs to be raised uh gently from its tip on the left side and it's it acts sort of like a spring so be careful once you lift this tip uh, you should be also holding it from the side here, otherwise it's just going to jump somewhere and there is a risk of you losing it. After you remove this clip, this metal bit, this one, okay, which is the end part of the gear linkage, should just lift up gently from the little metal shaft that's inside, okay, because this is placed uh, between the gearbox and this uh, and this lever, there's a, there's a bushing. So you shouldn't need too much force to, to remove this. 
Here is how it looks like after it was removed. So this is the metal plate that I mentioned that moves freely. And this is uh, behind here is the this is the shaft that had the clip on it. You can see it better. This is a shaft that had the clip on it and which hooked up to this hole. Right. Now this shaft now can actually be removed from the box uh, because we're going to need to install it uh, in the other unit, the one that we'll be putting inside the car. And lastly, the last um, linkage to the box is done via this universal joint that I'm showing you here uh, at the tip of my screwdriver, this bit. This is, uh, so this joint moves forwards, backwards, tilts to the left, tilts to the right, whenever you change gears, okay? And it has this, there's this metal connector. It's not actually a screw. It's a, it's a thin metal shaft, I don't know, uh, that needs to, that needs to be removed. And this is how the pin from the universal joint of the gearbox linkage looks like. Uh, so as I told you, it's not, it's not a bolt. Uh, I've actually had some difficulty removing it because it seems at the bottom it has this, this small tip uh, that you need to somehow push with, for example, with the tip of a screwdriver and at the same time push it from beneath uh, and that's how I got it out, okay? The next item on the list is we need to remove this metal bracket that connects the right hand side of the gearbox to the chassis of the car right here. And for that we have two bolts to remove on this side, one and two, so one here and one here. These are all Torx 18s. The third one here is also a Torx 18. And then after we remove these, there's a fourth bolt that you see here. Not sure of this, of the size of this one. Might also be a Torx 18. Um, but anyways, so we need to remove this bracket in order to allow the gearbox to move side to side and up and down so that we're able to later remove it all together from the car. Just one quick tip, uh, whenever you're removing lots of bolts from the car, uh, choose a way to know where each bolt is coming from. Either mark them down or whatever solution you see fit. Okay, and we've removed this bracket, like I showed you. And now, what we're gonna do is, we're left only with a few bolts, like this one, like this one, like this one here, and so on. These are the last bolts that actually connect the gearbox to the engine. So normally, once you re remove all of these, we can take the gearbox out. But before we do that, we will need to lower, using a jack, the entire engine and gearbox assembly so that we have room to take the gearbox outside on the left side. Now, two steps that should be done before this. Number one, the left-hand drive shaft, which normally sits around here, should be moved on the other side of the control arm, as I did here. And for that, you basically need to push on it a bit and just take it underneath the end point of the control arm. Just make sure the car needs to be jacked high enough, otherwise the tip of the drive shaft might hit the floor. And once you've done this, secure it again, so don't let it dangle on its own weight. And then the next step, a step, a step before you lower the engine and gearbox together, I would advise you just slacken each of the bolts Okay, so don't remove them, just slacken them a bit, like one full turn, for example, to make sure they're easy to come out once the engine and gearbox assembly have been has been lowered. And after slackening all of the bolts on the gearbox, the next major step is for us to lower the engine and gearbox assembly all together by a few centimeters so that we have room to remove the gearbox to the left. And there are multiple ways to do this. I actually used the jack from another car 
to jack it up on, on this point, this is the oil pan of the engine. And I've used this jack to hook up to a indentation inside the oil pan so that it's fixed, it doesn't move. And this is a jack that can take about three tons. And the, the weight of the engine and gearbox is about, is less than 200 kilograms. So there's no problem for this jack to raise and lower the engine. And this will also give us a lot of control on how much we can lower it. All right, and after that's secure, we come here to the left side of the car where we find the mounting of the gearbox to the chassis of the car. And as you can see, this mounting is composed of two large bolts for this part that connects to this other metal bracket. And this metal bracket actually connects via one, two, three bolts to the gearbox. And what we're gonna try to do is remove only these three. We, again, we don't wanna remove more than we need. We only, we wanna remove these three. And that, at that point, we should be able to lower the gearbox. So these bolts use a Torx 14 female head. And again, just work gently when removing these bolts. Make sure, maybe apply penetrating oil if you need, uh, but uh, be, be careful. And the solution I chose to keep uh, to keep track of the bolts is using a marker. I write on the bolt and on the hole that bolt belongs to a given number in increasing order from one. One, two, three, and four are underneath the car. And these are five, six, and seven. Okay, and you can see a number is both on the metal part near the bolt as well as on the bolt. And in this way, I'll, I'll keep track. What I did for increased safety I jacked both the oil sump of the engine with the black jack as well as the oil sump of the gearbox with another jack over there. And what I'm now doing is I'm lowering each one of them progressively. So lowering this one a bit, then lowering that one a bit and so on. And in this way, I have safety is doubled because I'm using two separate jacks. Okay, and you just need to lower it slowly so that it's down, I don't know, about five centimeters or so on. Uh, and then you should have room to remove it. Right, and you should stop when this line of bolts from here is close to the anchor point of the lower control arm. The last thing at this point is you'll see there are two more bolts. One of them is over there. And the second one is over there. Now, these have become accessible only now after we've lowered the gearbox and we should slacken them off as well before proceeding to remove all of the bolts that we slackened earlier and physically take the gearbox out. Um, just bear in mind, the gearbox is about 35 kilograms. That's more than 70 pounds. So uh, be mindful when you disconnect all the bolts and you take it out, it might seem a bit too heavy. I'm going to try and use the jack to remove it. Uh, but well, whatever solution works for you, just be careful of the weight. And I had removed the bolts and keep trying to take it, take it off and I didn't know why it wasn't coming off. It's because there's another bolt that is hidden very, very well. It's over there, you can see it. And you also obviously have to take this one out. I'm pretty sure this is the last one. And sure enough, after we've removed that last bolt, we managed to get the gearbox out. Had to use a jack to make sure that it came out smoothly and there were no problems. So as you can see, this is the uh, flywheel clutch and flex plate, they're in good condition. That's a little bit of oil from the gearbox. Um, as you can see, the color is pretty good. It's only dark, it's only darkened because it's filthy on the floor. But you can also see the color of the oil right here. Assuming the light is good. See, so it's bright, you can see it's bright orange which indicates that this box, which has six years and 99,000 kilometers, is in pretty good shape. 
so the oil is not black there are no metal chips on it you can see the color of the oil is pretty good um, it's just filthy obviously but other there are no other leaks this is this is not um, this is not actually wet it's just very very smooth but it's not wet so there isn't an oil leak from here and the rest of it is just well very very filthy but apart from that it's in pretty good shape and this is the slave cylinder which turns smoothly no squeaks no noises so this gearbox is in very good shape and obviously there's some uh, clutch dust but that's not really a problem so now we took this out um we're gonna put it on a pan somewhere so the oil doesn't spill too much on the floor and obviously we're gonna start installing the other one and before beginning the installation of the other box i noticed a problem uh namely in this point you can see there is a bolt stub stuck in there and this actually happens to be this bolt it goes like this which actually holds the uh, um, gear shifter linkage so it's absolutely critical that we remove that stub before we proceed with any installation steps because otherwise this thing obviously doesn't you can see it doesn't go in now because this is made of aluminum and i'm guessing the bolt is made of steel um, one approach we're gonna try is we're gonna try to drill a small pilot hole in the middle of the bolt and then use a bolt extractor and see if we can get lucky with that if not uh, maybe we'll try to apply some heat locally in case there's any rust formed um, and maybe allow the the metals to uh, expand a little bit and maybe that will make it easier for to remove the stub but before all of that we're gonna apply some penetrating fluid and after a couple of hours of trying we managed to get the stub out you can still see that reddish pinkish dust inside that's from the red loctite and what we did end up doing was we used a heater to progressively heat the outside of the bolt case this is aluminum so aluminum expands more than steel and we heated this progressively and we used a easy out set like this which because it was so tight in there we had to connect it using an eight millimeter hexagonal bit stuffed in with a with a hammer and with a with a wrench uh, plus the heat this is how we managed to get it out and i'm pretty sure we didn't damage the uh, the threads inside so yeah quite a lot of work for this but uh, thank heavens we managed to pull it out and before we installed the box uh, we took several steps first step is cleaning but i'm not saying to clean it to make it shiny but just to clean all the points where transmission oil can leak out right because you want to know after you install the box if there are any leaks and that means clean this area right beneath the input shaft in case oil drips you'll know it, you'll see it from here clean the outputs of the drive shafts uh, the place where the drive shafts go in but make sure if you use brake clean not to touch the the rubber gasket so just the aluminium outside clean the reverse the place for the reverse sensor this also acts as an uh, oil filler location the breather again this can also work to fill the transmission oil the selector shaft okay also clean around it and the last bit that you want to clean you can let's see if it's visible here is this point here this is your transmission oil level indicator we'll be using this later to make sure that we fill the transmission to the correct level okay so as well as obviously the uh, output drive shaft uh, location as i said earlier okay uh now we proceed to put in the 
uh, gearbox, gearbox linking uh, screw, the one that we had to, whose bit we had to take out earlier, that was broken. This is how it looks like. And okay, that one most likely used red Loctite. We're gonna use blue Loctite, which is a strong adhesive, but not as strong. Blue Loctite also allows us to remove it later in case we need to. Okay, so just apply a coating and then screw it by hand until you can no longer screw it by hand. Okay. And then you need a 19 millimeter key and it tightens fairly easily. Um, I looked through the Haynes manual, there are no torque values given for this bolt, uh, but given that it's supposed to be tight and the, the presence of the lot tight with it uh, and such, uh, tighten it by hand uh, to make sure it's pretty tight, but try not to over tighten, you don't want to break it, okay? So, just a little bit more. Okay, now it's tight. Okay, and you can see it. It's over there. The next step is to install the reverse switch. And we're doing this because the existing one from the box you see has the plastic cap a bit damaged. So we bought a new one. Again, you see this had some thread locker on it, which is why we're also gonna use thread locker on ours. We've cleaned this area before. Just make sure it is as clean as it can be. Okay. And similarly, apply a little bit of Loctite. Okay. And this can be tightened by hand. Once you can't tighten it anymore, you need a 22 millimeter wrench. And again, there is a torque value given for this, but I don't have the corresponding uh, bit to connect to a torque wrench. So I'll just tighten it by hand. Uh, don't necessarily over tighten, but make sure it's uh, it's snug. All right. That's it. And the last bit is we need to install the uh, clutch slave cylinder, which goes here. First, make sure this area around the input shaft of the box is very clean. Next thing we want to install a new rubber seal. This came with the with the clutch slave cylinder. Um, so a quick tip before you install the uh, the rubber seal just apply a little bit of transmission oil to it. Make sure it's not dry. Okay, so make sure it's well lubricated and we just install this gently into the metal. You see, it doesn't really take much force. It goes in fairly easily. Make sure it's not bent when you install it. All right, after we've done this, we take our new slave cylinder. This one is from Luke. We ease it gently. Actually, it would be a similarly good idea to apply a little bit of a little bit of oil on the shaft. We'll clean this up later, but we just apply it for now for um, 
in order to get the cylinder easier inside and we very gently push it into position this plastic cap needs to be removed we gently push it into position until it sits on the gasket and then we have three bolts we insert one insert them one at a time start by tightening by hand number one number two and number three okay now using a wrench just gently even need this I think just gently insert the uh, tighten the bolts I'm being a bit clumsy it seems okay all three bolts like I said need to be first tightened by hand uh one at a time so don't do not tighten one all the way and then move to the others tighten each one bit by bit to make sure that the force is applied you uh in a uniform fashion to each of the three mounting points All right, so now they're all uniformly tightened. We will take this plastic bit that came with the slave cylinder and we need to insert it from the outside to the inside until it goes click. And after that is done, all three bolts need to be tightened to a specific torque which for this application is 10 newton meters and this is it installed so cylinder this is the plastic extension that you can see here that connects the outside to the cylinder here when we installed this we pushed it all the way until it clicked there was an audible click okay and we've tightened the three bolts to 10 newton meters now 10 newton meters is the torque spec for this piece by luke uh, i think the original only needs about 7 newton meters but you in case you're doing this operation just double check and uh, read the uh, read the spec they're given in the manual right so at this point with the with this installed with the reverse switch installed and the slave cylinder installed we are ready to put the box back in the car and because apparently I forgot, there's one more thing to put in, which is this bit. Uh, this is where the uh, clutch pipe comes in. That is where we'll do the clutch pipe bleed, uh, bleeding. And this lower bit goes inside the tip that we've just installed. Double check. Uh, double check both of these entries should have these metal clips installed and it should the lower one you just push it in and it should be it should just click into place like that and with some effort we managed to raise the new box and install it uh, back into the uh, engine mounting at which point we inserted the bolts that connect the gearbox to the engine 
Um, and now we're at the point where we're gonna torque them down. And with the torquing, you need to uh, note the, the thickness of each bolt because bolts that are 12, uh, that are M12, so 12 millimeters thick, need to be tightened to 60, 60 Newton meters. Whereas bolts that are 10 millimeters thick need to be tightened to 40 Newton meters. Okay, um, if you're in the process of installing the gearbox, uh, you'll note that you might need to wobble it a bit uh, to make before the input shaft of the gearbox actually connects to the... Um, the splines of the shaft actually connect to the uh, center of the clutch. And do note again that it is a fairly heavy unit at over 35 kilos. We did struggle a bit to, to install it. We used two jacks to raise it progressively and then uh, fit it into place. And after securing the bolts that connect the transmission to the engine, um, we want to hook up the assembly that connects the gear engine, the gear linkage to the gearbox. Meaning this metal bit that goes onto this metal bolt that we installed at the beginning, the one that was broken in the old box, uh, that was broken in this box before, and the plastic universal joint that connects to the gearbox anchor here, and which actually controls the gear changes. Remember that for this universal joint, you had this pin, okay, this special pin with the hook at the end, and uh, just install these, put this metal bit on the bolt, on this special bolt, and install that metal clip at the top, and then connect the universal joint to the hook of the gearbox and insert the pin. And this is how it looks like once everything is installed. So that's the U joint for the gearbox selection and this is the linkage assembly support with the metal clip on top. Now we can raise the engine and gearbox. Uh, take note of the right hand drive shaft in case you need to check its position to make sure when you raise the engine that it doesn't get blocked somewhere and that it will align with the right hand output uh, uh, hole of the gearbox. And following the installation of the U-joint clip, we raise the engine and gearbox assembly back to its original horizontal position using as many jacks as you like. I've used two, one under the engine oil bay and one under the gearbox oil pan to raise them. And we install the three bolts, one, two and third there at the back that connect the gearbox to the mounting on the chassis. I've also used some blue Loctite as I did with all of the bolts that I installed. And now we just need to torque them down. And the correct torque for these bolts is 80 Newton meters, 80 or 59 foot pounds. And another quick tip. If you want to keep track of which bolts have been torqued down, pick whatever solution you like. Uh, what I did, I chose to simply color the entire bolt head with the same marker that I used to number the bolt, as you can see here. I did the same on all the other bolts. And moving underneath the car, we're under the right hand side drive shaft. We've also added this bolt back. If you remember, for this bolt and for the bolt, this top bolt of the bracket that we'll be installing, we had to remove the metal clip here so that we're able to push the linkage assembly a bit uh, towards the top. So now this bolt is put back. This was an M12, so we've torqued it to 60 Newton meters or 44 foot pounds. We were also able to torque the last one, the last smaller bolt here. We weren't able to do this when the engine and gearbox were still down because we were blocked by the exhaust pipe. But now because we've raised them all up, we gained access and we torqued this one. This is an M10, so it got torqued to 
32 pound feet or about 40 newton meters and the last bit that we need to add is the bracket that connects the right hand side of the gearbox to the car's chassis and after finishing with all those bolts we continue with the reconnection of the uh, hose which feeds uh, hydraulic fluid to the clutch slave cylinder we remove the plastic that we kept for protection against dirt ingress and also the cap that was in there for the same purpose and we join them together again make sure this rubber bushing is present and with this metal cap pushed all the way through you'll know the connection is done when you hear a click like that okay and after the click is done okay the pipe no longer comes out everything is secure you can take something to clean any excess brake fluid that has dripped again be careful this damages paint and after that don't forget to connect the reverse switch again you can only put it in one way it has this plastic lip that needs to go on top of the plastic tip that's on the other side of the connector and you just push until it clicks like that now it's fixed okay after doing these two we're gonna move on next to connect the right hand side drive shaft and then connect the lower control arm to the right hand wheel and we are at the point where we're reinstalling the right hand side drive shaft um quick notes before inserting put a little bit of transmission oil on your finger uh make sure to apply a little bit on the uh, oil seal of the uh, transmission exit maybe a little bit on the dust cap on the drive shaft and most importantly make sure that the tip of the drive shaft has this circlip still in place you see this metal ring here because this is your securing point this actually keeps the drive shaft inside the transmission once everything is in place this thing should just fit in uh, smoothly with a click And after we've connected the right hand side drive shaft, we need to connect the lower control arm back to the wheel hub. It should be just a case of aligning the two, but if you are, you are having difficulties pushing them, move it a bit and maybe use a soft faced mallet to tap underneath. Okay, don't use a metal or too tough a mallet because this is this is rubber there is also metal but this is also a there's also a rubber component in here and you don't want to damage it so keep trying until eventually the spline will fit inside the hub and then you can tighten the 16 millimeter bolt that holds them together and when tightening note that the head the, the head of the bolt goes to the front uh, put a 16 millimeter wrench on it to keep it in place and then the nut at the back the one if you can see it the one here is tightened to 60 newton meters or 44 pound feet and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill the box with oil um, as i mentioned before there are three points that you can use to fill the oil we're gonna use the breather, so the topmost point to fill, but we need to know how much to fill. And for that, we're gonna use the oil level plug, which is right here next to the left drive shaft output that you can see here. And uh, we're gonna do, we're actually gonna do this before plugging in the left drive shaft. 
And the reason why we're going to do this is this gives us more access to remove and reinstall the level plug. And you also notice that the way the level plug works is you know that the box is full with oil when it starts dripping from the plug's location. And as you can see, the lowest point of the fill plug, of the level plug, is actually a bit lower <clears throat> than the lowest point of the output of the dry shaft. So this means that when the box is correctly filled, oil will not be leaking from the uh, drive shaft output. So it's safe to do this. We shouldn't lose any oil, even though the drive shaft is not yet installed. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, from the top, we're gonna pour oil and pour, remove this, and pour until it starts to come out from here. This also makes sense because we don't know how much oil we still have in the box. We did drain most of it through the drive shaft exits when we brought the box. Uh, but there might still be a little bit in there. So just to know, to make sure that we fill to the limit, we're also going to use the drain plug. Now, a quick note, this takes a 13 millimeter socket to remove. I've already slackened it and removed by hand. And as you can see, its face also doubles as a magnet, right? for metal shavings from the box. And the way this looks, I think it look, it means the box is in fairly good shape. There's only a little bit of metal shavings on the magnet. We're gonna clean it up and for now not install it, pour the oil and the moment we see oil coming out from there, we know the box is correctly filled and then we're gonna plug the bolt and tighten it back. And this is our gearbox breather at the very top of the box there's a metal bit with a plastic cap on top i think this takes a 17 millimeter to remove we've already slackened this so it should be a simple case of unscrewing it okay and it's out okay this is just a so the purpose of this is, in case there's any air in the box, it's, it comes out through here, but it should in principle prevent oil from leaking. And now we're gonna pour in the oil. And checking the manual for the oil spec, it says that for the manual and Easytronic transmissions, we need to use oil code 0912-0541. And what I found, for example, is I found this oil from Febi Bilstein, which is a 70W90 GL5 spec, which um, conforms to the code from here. Now, the box typically takes about 1.6 liters. Um, so we got two oil bottles. And we've made this small assembly using a small flexible pipe that goes right in through the breather. And we start to pour gently. Do note that this oil is fairly thick. So take your time, make sure the oil goes in correctly and it doesn't spill through here. And pour a little bit and then go check the, the level plug and so on until you notice that the level plug starts to drip. At that point, tighten everything back and you know that you filled to the correct level. And sure enough, after, well, exactly 1.6 liters, you can see that oil is starting to come out from the level plug, but nothing is coming out from the drive shaft exit. So now all we're gonna do is we're gonna put the drain uh, the level plug back on, tighten it to spec, and then we can put the breather cap on top, and then we can continue with the remaining steps. And for the torque specs, the oil level plug needs to be tightened to 22 newton meters or 16 pound feet, and the breather, the, the one that we used to Add oil and needs to be tightened to 30 newton meters. And right now I'm under the left front wheel and we've put everything back together. 
identically to the right hand side wheel so the first of all the drive shaft we've oiled the um, rubber gasket at the end we've oiled the shaft connected them until we heard the click and then verified that we can't pull the drive shaft outside by hand anymore then we proceeded to connect the lower control arm to the wheel hub using similarly a soft mallet to push it from beneath and when it got in we pushed the bolt through here and we're gonna tighten the nut apply some thread locker before that and then tighten to 60 newton meters as the manual says identically to how we did on the right hand side wheel the next procedure we're gonna do is the adjustment of the gear linkage since we've uh, changed gearboxes the manual recommends that this adjustment be performed now the way this is done is you go inside the car and using a plastic tip or something you begin by raising the uh, stick shift gator which is this bit okay you raise it all the way to the top then you have this plastic clip at the top which you need to pull to make sure it disengages okay and then with some force you simply pull the uh, knob out all right in order to pull it up you need to apply some force underneath this, this uh, white clip a little bit of force and then it comes up normally next thing you do is you take this white piece of plastic you raise it up and then you turn it by 90 degrees and you push it back in and when you put it back you might need to move the stick a little bit because on this side on the right side there's a small plastic tip right here that needs to come in inside this black metal bit i'm sorry you can't see it very well because of the poor light so you need to push the lever a bit to your towards the let's say first and reverse and then push the plastic all the way down and you'll know it's correctly seated when you can no longer see you can't move the stick anymore okay so this adjustment position basically all it does is it holds your gear stick in place for for the next steps okay and now moving on underneath the car we're under the right hand side you can see the bracket that we installed earlier and the clip that we put and you'll notice there is this screw right here okay this is a torx 50 screw and this what this does it basically it holds together the gear linkage on the shifter side with the linkage on the gearbox side and when we want to do the adjustment what we'll need to do is we need to slacken this off a bit but be careful don't remove it okay so just slacken it so that it allows the two parts to have some play between each other and the last step for the adjustment we need to press on this spring over there this little spring that comes out of the gearbox's top with the yellow head and at the same time move the uh, linkage with the plastic universal joint that we connected earlier ever so slightly left and right until the yellow tip with the spring goes all the way inside the box you'll know when it's done at the moment when it's fully inside the box and it uh, sort of like clicks and here it is you can see it's pressed all the way in it clicked and we had to move the plastic u-joint uh, down there just a little bit to the left and right to make it click now the manual again recommends that this procedure be done with the battery out that's why we did it right now uh, if you want to do it and you have the battery it's not like it's impossible but it might be a bit more difficult because you'll have to reach for the yellow uh, for the yellow bit uh, from this side rather than directly from the from beneath the battery tray all right and now 
with all the components fixed in place so we have fixed in place both the linkage on the uh, shifter side and the linkage on the gearbox side and with both of these shifted and uh, fixed in place now we need to go beneath the car and tie that nut that we opened earlier the t51 uh, the t50 torx one and we're back under the car and we tighten the bolt it needs to be tightened to 12 newton meters then a further 180 degrees and then a further 45 degrees so that's 12 newton meters plus 225 degrees once that's done we can go back inside the car and put the all the components of the shifter back together and we're back in the car with the adjustment done we need to put everything together so raise the white plastic bit turn it 90 degrees back to the left and push it down such that this is towards the front okay and you push it down all the way through doesn't take too much force then you take your shifter knob make sure it's facing obviously towards the front and push it down make sure that the white tip clips back onto the uh, it just clicks in place like that once that's done this is pushed down okay push the white uh, nut that was here that we raised initially push it all the way down again until it clicks and then put the gator back on as it was before this one also clicks into place just like that okay and now we've adjusted our gear linkage and uh, just as an, a small note once the adjustment has been done and you've moved the shifter a bit to the left and to the right if you come back to the to the gearbox you'll see that the small plunger here the one with the with the metal coil that we pushed before automatically was pushed out so there's nothing uh, more that you need to do here the the linkage has been adjusted and the next step is the reinstallation of the battery tray uh, so a few points to note here i had to jiggle it a bit to to get it into the correct position because it not only has to align with the three bolts remember we also have to place it correctly with respect to the uh, ECU tray, which is here. And as I said at the beginning, there are one, two, and three connecting points where the tray gets linked to the ECU tray. So we put those correctly. And remember that we uh, dismounted the clips without cutting them, which is helpful now because we just need to put them back. There is one clip that goes here the second one goes here the third one is behind this plastic bit where my uh, finger is pointing somewhere over there and the fourth one is this so they all just clip in if you chose to cut the jubilees then right now you would need to install new clips i didn't so i still have them in working order and install them and the last bit don't forget there is that negative point to which we need to connect the small wire that we disconnected initially to be able to raise the ECU tray. Um, the manual doesn't specify a torque setting for these bolts. So what I did, I just applied some uh, uh, thread locker, blue thread locker and tighten them down by hand. You don't need to tighten them too hard because they only their only role is to clamp the plastic tray to the metal chassis. Just make sure it's properly fixed and it doesn't move. And now we need to put the battery back. And when installing the battery, 
first and foremost put it back into its correct position now in my case the positive uh, point is here and the negative one is here to the front also marked on the battery i've once again disconnected the auxiliary connection from the positive point so i can have room to install the battery next remember we had this plastic clip which goes here to the front this gets placed towards the front and the back depending on the size of the battery in our case this was locked in position here and it just clips in and this sort of prevents the battery from moving all right and the next step will be to reinstall the clamp that firmly holds the battery in place now for these nuts the one from the terminals and this one i don't have a torque spec uh, in the manual so again just tighten by hand try not to over tighten to avoid damaging the threads uh, correction actually i noticed that on the plastic cap from the battery holder it actually does say uh, 10 newton meters max so there's a torque setting and after that's tight we put on the auxiliary connection cap which remember is clipped in three places one two on this side and three on this one just clips into place and then remember to reinstall and tighten this bolt which ensures the connection to the positive terminal again tighten this one by hand and after all that is done make sure the uh, the car key is not in the uh, ignition position and finally we will have to attach the negative terminal uh, negative connection back to the battery's negative terminal and again tighten the bolt by hand and that's it for the battery reinstallation and we're very close to finishing the uh, uh, to finishing this work the last very important thing that we need to do is we need to bleed the uh, clutch system because we've introduced air into the system by disconnecting the components there are multiple ways to do the bleeding uh, in the case of our uh, look slave cylinder the instructions actually tell us how the bleeding should be done and what they're saying is we should first bleed the circuit from the bleed nipple to the fluid reservoir at the top that's step one and then step two is from the bleed nipple down to the slave cylinder we're going to tackle step one first and step one says that we should use a special device that generates a bit of pressure and pull fluid and air through the nipple from the top now we don't have that device so what we're going to do is we're going to use the gravity method meaning we're just going to open the nipple and for a while let some fluid and air come out and uh it should be caught in a, a jar or a bucket or something underneath. Uh, very important. So first of all, we remove the plastic foil that we added here when we started working. I, I mentioned then that we add this to prevent additional air getting into the system. But now when we do the bleeding, we're going to leave it open. Uh, don't take too long for this procedure because the... As I said earlier, the brake fluid is hygroscopic, so it absorbs moisture from the air. So it shouldn't really be exposed to air for too long. First and foremost, make sure that the fluid reservoir is stopped to the max. In our case, it already is. We've lost very little fluid during the operation. Uh, make sure to have by your side some brake fluid. In the case of Corsa, Corsa takes uh, .4, okay, so just some .4 blade fluid. Uh, it doesn't really matter what brand you use, for the vast majority of cases, uh, .4 fluids as well as .3 are miscible, so you can combine them together, but double check this, as far as I know, .4 at least is miscible. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to open the bleed nipple, uh, from underneath the car because we have more access and then just for a while let some fluid drain out with air and constantly keep an eye out on the fluid level in the 
brake fluid reservoir. This must never drop below the minimum. If it drops below the minimum, what you're gonna do is you're actually allowing air into the system and then you're gonna start the bleeding procedure all over again, but not just for the clutch, also for the brakes. Okay, so just be careful. Keep topping up the reservoir as fluid is getting, uh, is getting out. And one more quick tip. Normally, the when you're tightening the bleed nipple, when everything is over, it should be tightened to a relatively small torque, like 5 newton meters or something. But if you don't have such a small torque wrench, or don't want to complicate too much, what you can do is, before you open the system, you can, for example, mark a spot on the nipple head, as well as on the uh, body where the nipple goes in, where the bleed nipple goes in, like this. And then when you open it and do the bleeding and you close it, you only need to align the two markings uh, like they were at the beginning. You don't normally need to open the bleed nipple more than one or two full turns. Sometimes it's just like a quarter of a turn, half a turn, something like that. So I've marked them down, so now I know how much I have to tighten everything back once uh, once it's over. And I've slackened the nipple using a 12 millimeter key, and I can open it gently by hand. And at some point, there you go. Brake fluid is now coming out. We'll just leave it like this. For a while. To drain. Maybe it's not very visible on the film, but you can see it bubbling down here. Okay, so just let this drain for a while and then at some point you stop and we're gonna move to the second step of the bleeding okay we finished that procedure we've tightened the bleed nipple back to its original position we've topped up the reservoir to the max with brake fluid now we're gonna move on to the second step which is to bleed the slave cylinder and you can see i have a jar that i filled with brake fluid and the plastic tube goes inside the fluid it mustn't be exposed to air uh, one end is on the nipple the other end is already submerged in brake fluid brake fluid okay and the procedure is with an, with the help of an assistant we will have to press the clutch pedal several times and allow fluid and air to come out while operating the bleed nipple so in detail someone is going to slowly press the clutch pedal all the way down emphasis on slowly and only once then i'll open the bleed nipple uh, allow fluid and air to come out under the pressure generated from the clutch pedal actuation and uh, from the master cylinder then i'm gonna close the bleed nipple during this time the pedal must remain pressed and then only after i've closed the bleed nipple can the clutch pedal be gently raised to its original position then we wait for a couple of seconds and repeat the procedure it should be repeated uh, at least 10 times maybe even closer to 20 times in any case until you only see clean fluid without bubbles coming out from the tube press okay and we open and there's fluid and air coming out. Okay, now we tighten. Release. Okay, and, and then we repeat this cycle 10, 15 times until only fluid comes out. And finally, after bleeding the clutch, we are done with the reinstallation of the box. Which means the last things that we need to do is we need to install this metal bracket that you see here. And in our case, we've also installed the underbody shield back on. Now, 
For this bracket, I haven't seen any torque specifications. I torqued these to 35 Newton meters, which seems to be uh, pretty solid. These are 16 millimeter bolts. Uh, if you do happen to have an underbody shield for this kind of application, it's quite useful because what you can do is you can clean the inside of the shield like I did here. So it's very clean. And then once you take the car out for a test drive and you come back, you can look and see if there are any spills, oil or whatever, uh, which would be a good indicator if, uh, if anything leaks. If you don't have this and it leaks, you might not be able to uh, see where the leak came from or if it happened at all. Right, so now all of this is done. We've already started the car and uh, everything seems to be working normal. The gear shifts just fine, clutch is okay. I haven't seen any leaks. So last thing we need to do is we need to take the, the jack stands out, lower the car and tighten the wheel nuts. And finally, after removing the jack stands from underneath the car, we're tightening the wheels. Very important heels, uh, very important thing here. So wheels should be mounted and the wheel nuts installed and tightened, let's say by hand, when the car is still on the jack stands. You don't torque the bolts when the car is still up. You only torque them once the car sits on the ground. And the bolts for the Corsa, for the Corsa D should be tightened to 110 Newton meters. Always tighten in a star pattern to make sure that the wheel sits, sits flush. Okay, this one's the third. All right, and the fourth. And that's it. We're going out for a test drive. See how the new gearbox behaves. And this is a follow-up after driving for about 300 miles, 500 kilometers, give or take with the car. And there are a couple of notes I'd like to make. I'm gonna let you know the what went well, what didn't go well, what needed to be fixed. So, number one is checking after a while that you're not losing any fluids. First thing and most important to check is you wanna check the level of your brake fluid. Um, and because brake fluid is used for both brakes and activating the clutch, you'll know the level when you've swapped the box and you've topped up the reservoir and after you drive for a couple of days uh, miles kilometers whatever if you do notice that the level of fluid in the brake reservoir has dropped then you know there's a problem now it could be because it means fluid is leaking somewhere which means you need to check all four wheels to see if by chance for example you've developed a leak at one of the brake lines and if those are clean the only uh, other way you could lose fluid is if the uh, clutch slave cylinder is leaking. In that case, you need to take a look at the base of the gearbox to see if there's any um, um, fluid uh, remains or anything that would indicate that fluid has been lost from there. If you see anything, especially the brake fluid, which is uh, orangey, Okay, then it means there's a problem with the uh, slave cylinder, the clutch slave cylinder, and unfortunately you're gonna have to, well, take everything uh, out, uh, the box I mean, and check the condition of the slave cylinder. Number two is the gearbox oil level. As I showed you earlier, there is that procedure that you need to, you, to do to fill the box with oil. But after driving, uh, I would recommend that you spend some time and see if the oil needs topping up. Now, one important aspect to consider is when we topped up the, the box, the car was not horizontal, okay? Because we had the back wheels on the ground, but the front wheels were a bit raised. Now, at the moment, they're also raised. But what I'm going to do a bit later is I'm going to put it on level ground, take off this wheel with a simple jack underneath here. Make sure that the car is level and again, remove the drain plug 
the oil level plug from the left side of the box see if there's any oil dripping if oil is dripping it means that the box has the correct amount of oil but if no oil is dripping then you need to as before add some additional oil through the breather cap which just to remind you is hidden over there you see the one with the black plastic cap and as before you add oil until it starts dripping from the level indicator but again make sure that you're on level ground when you do this operation and secure the car thoroughly underneath and after checking everything it turned out that i actually needed to top up a bit with gearbox oil uh mind you it is colder right now than it was when we first changed the gearbox by a couple of degrees um and i needed to add about 100 150 additional milliliters of oil your mileage may vary but take into account that temperature should be uh, moderate and uh, the car must be level when you top up and the final mention um, has to do with the cruise control so it only applies if uh, your car actually has cruise control or you plan on installing cruise control a bit later so what happened was after i swapped the box and went out to test it i noticed that the cruise control stopped working in gears 4 and 5 uh, it was working fine in gears 2 and 3 and on gears 4 and 5 when you would turn it on it would turn on for about half a second and then turn off automatically did a bit of research looked a bit around and the problem had to do with the car's software the the software version on the ecu and what was happening was the cruise control was no longer working in gears 4 and 5 because the ratios were so different to the old ones that the mapping between speed and rpm that the ecu knew which would apply to the old box would no longer align with the new one so the ecu would simply say okay i'm not seeing the correlation between the rpm and the speed that i'm expecting to see so i'm just disengaging the cruise control okay and i solved this by going to a opal specialized service and they did a software update which solved the problem and now everything is working uh, as you'd expect it to work just bear in mind um, regarding the software update you need to double check that the two boxes are um, i mean that the new box that you want to install is compatible with your car in my case i knew as you've seen earlier in the films that the new box that i installed was taken from a corsa d so it wasn't taken from other opals voxels whatnot it had the same final drive as the original box only gears three four and five were different the reason cruise control would work on gear three is because the ratio between the third gear and this new box versus the old box were close enough so that the tolerances inside the ecu would be uh, would not be exceeded that's why it was working uh, so bear this in mind because for example if you take uh let's say you have a cr gearbox okay so the one with the short ratios and you put a wr wide ratio box but which also let's say has a different final drive than the uh the original one the one that you have on the car what's going to happen is even for example if you do a software update the cruise control might not work because then the combination of gear ratios and final drive would be too different to what the car would expect so make sure that the box you're installing is from the same uh, vehicle ideally same engine specification and same year interval as the old one okay so in my case as i showed you the new box that i installed was also taken from a corsa d same engine 1.4 a14 xer uh, so that's why uh, it was compatible and that's why the software update uh, solved the cruise control problem okay uh, so once again hope this film 
is helpful to anyone but uh, again if you plan on working on your car alone take all the necessary precautions that you can um, and I don't um, um, so if you're planning on working on your car based on what you've seen here I strongly urge you to take all the necessary precautions especially when you're working underneath the car support it on jack stands maybe several ways of making sure that it doesn't collapse on you while you're working um, and do take note I don't take any responsibility through this film for what you may be doing to your car I just did this film to show what I did in the hopes that it might be helpful to anyone in the future okay take care everyone bye bye